And, you know, you guys talked about pornography and, and the fact that porn isn't good for men. And I have spent so many years trying to convince men that porn isn't good for them. And I think I have managed to convince a lot of men that porn isn't good, of them, good for them, to be honest, because people email me and because I have friends who've decided to wa stop watching porn and things like that. Um, and, you know, one, one aspect of that is just that men have, most men, especially young men, have never been told that porn isn't good for them. They just assume that it's this neutral thing and everybody uses it and it's harmless and it's it's just fantasy and it's basically the same as masturbation and i know that because when i when i criticize pornography men will say oh you don't you don't think men should masturbate and i'm like nope you can do whatever you want i'm talking about porn specifically like they can't even separate the two anymore um but i thought that the angle that you two took was useful and and convincing, which which I appreciate. And again, because it's just, it's so rare for people to talk about the fact that porn really isn't good for you. Like it's just, it's so normalized and I find it really, I don't know, depressing, I guess, and obviously a bit disturbing in some ways, but I wonder if you can explain your perspective on, on porn. Yeah, um, super fascinating and unnerving that men are conflating masturbation with porn. Frankly, it hadn't occurred to me that people would be actually unable to separate those two. But um, we argue, uh, we, we invent a phrase in the book. We say that porn creates a kind of what we call sexual autism. And uh, we are not, you know, we are no way talking about actual, actual autistic people, but we borrow basically the, um, you know, the diagnosis, the criteria for what autism is. And the fact that people with autism have um, different responses to social interactions and have a tendency to engage in repetitive behavior and expect repetitive things back when they engage in repetitive behavior that makes it difficult for them to have relationships in some cases with, um, with other people. And we then, you know, without getting into what autism is or, you know, what is causal with regard to autism, porn, we argue, creates a kind of sexual autism in that um, by having fantasies with things, with pictures, and videos that cannot respond to you, that are entirely inert with regard to uh, what it is that you do with them or to them or at them. It creates this sense that that's what sex is. And that when you actually do have a real living, breathing human being in front of you, with you, potentially interested in engaging with you sexually, you are more likely to be repetitive, to try the same tricks that you learned um, in porn, just over and over and over again, to not even know what it would be like to respond to a person's pleasure or pain, to a person you know, engaging in such a way that it clearly is, oh, that's wonderful, do more of that, or uh, you know, I'm not, this isn't working for me. And you know, master, there's no problem with masturbation, right? Like you're, you're responding to your own body and you know you're not gonna learn anything about anyone else's body that way, but it's totally different from porn because porn exactly creates this sense that, you know, especially that, that women enjoy things that most women don't enjoy and that you can, because you can watch the same thing over and over and over again, that a woman will always respond the same way to a particular uh, to input. And it's, it's just not what humans are and it's certainly not what sex is supposed to be. I think there are a couple other things that, uh, need to be uh, in the discussion here. One, it is important, especially if you're going to reach people with this question. Um, porn is so normalized that you're right, it's very hard to compel people there's anything wrong with it. The fact, uh, what we say is there's nothing wrong with erotica, right? Erotica has ancient roots and it's an important part of human history. Um, the problem with porn and the distinction between them is the business model. Right, pornographers are not making a statement about sex. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get your attention. And what we have are effectively competing companies using uh, their sex worker employees to get your attention, and that creates competition. Right? How do how if what you're doing is depicting humans having sex with each other? There's nothing novel about that. How are you going to get your product into 
people's computer screens uh, when you've got so many competitors? Well, you're going to go to more extreme stuff, right? You're going to paint a picture of sexuality that is inherently more extreme. Where are you going to get the extremes? You're going to get them from taboos, right? You're going to get them from violence and incest and whatever else. And the problem, the biggest problem is that very young people see that stuff. And human beings are actually built to discover what sex is supposed to be like. You know, in, in the, the Kalahari, the Bushmen frequently learn about sex because they're not fully asleep in the huts where their parents have sex. And they get a sense, therefore, for what sex really looks like, right? That's weird. It feels weird to us moderns. But, but the point is, if you've got this circuitry that's trying to understand what the sex thing is that's so powerful, and then you've got pornographers putting out this stuff that's all uh, extreme, taboo-driven, you know, economically competitive sex that gets attention, it creates the impression that that's the normal thing. And it's a very wrong impression, right? Erotica doesn't do that because erotica not being motivated by um, the profit motive is more likely to make an interesting statement. It may be provocative, but it's not driven by the need to get your attention away from somebody else. So, um, Porn also takes the, the mystery out, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're a young person who hasn't yet, um, you know, been naked with someone else who hasn't yet had a sexual encounter with someone else. It's all a, a fantasy. It's all in your imagination. And you are wondering lots of things, some of which is, are possible, some of which aren't, some of which will be pleasurable, some of which won't. Maybe you're wrong on some of those in both directions. Um, but once you start flooding your brain with images and videos of things that people are actually doing, it replaces your own imagination. So it simultaneously... Um, cements in place some behaviors that probably aren't healthy. And it also, um, it actually, you know, we, we like to, it's easy to talk about the kinds of things that happen in porn that are that are grotesque and that shouldn't be on the menu at all for almost all human beings. But it also limits, right? Like, you know, there's just, there's so many things that two people can do with one another. And if what you've seen is some porn, that's kind of going to be what you think is possible, you know? So it's also going to limit what um, what you do sexually in, in terms of exploration. Yeah, the creativity point is is huge. And the the way to think about it is, this doesn't sound right, but sexual fantasy is a big part of what human beings conjure, right? And there's a reason for that, right? Those fantasies are not, its people think they're a free-for-all, but they're not. Your mind is very interested in fantasizing certain things and about certain people, and those that affects your behavior in the world. Um, to the extent that you take that, the exercise of writing sexual narratives in your mind uh, and you become a consumer of somebody else's narrative that they've built to get your attention, you lose the capacity to be sexually creative, and it's not a capacity you want to surrender. So Heather's right. I, from what we hear from young people that we talk to, it sounds like uh, sex has become very formulaic, very uh, focused on certain fringe activities, including people wanting to choke each other and things like this that aren't part of a normal relationship. And, you know, I think those who would defend porn need to just step back and look at it and say, what are the chances that these behaviors are really actually healthy and in my interest? And what are the chances that I've become addicted to some product that somebody wants to sell me and that I need to wean myself away from it for my own good? 